It's almost 80 years since the hydroelectric department, as it was then, generated the first few megawatts of energy from Tasmanian water at Watamana. In those days, it was picks and shovels, horse teams and wood stave pipelines. In the 1990s, we designed by computer and we track our tunnels with satellite navigation systems. In 1994, the Anthony Power development will be completed, marking the end of an important era, the last major construction project of the Hydroelectric Commission. From now on, our focus will be on establishing new directions, developing new markets and seeking new initiatives. But while we must now look to the future, it's important to look back and to recognise and acknowledge the abilities, the skills and the hard work of the many thousands of people whose achievements built the Hydro's world-class reputation. This video tells the story of 80 years of excellence in design, engineering and construction, in the words and through the eyes of the people who were there. I hope you enjoy it. In Tasmania, we take our power from the sky. As far back as the 1880s, small local schemes on Tasmanian rivers were generating hydroelectricity. Before the turn of the century, Launceston streets were lit by power from Duck Reach in the Cataract Gorge. Then, in 1914, the Tasmanian government purchased the assets of a private company struggling to complete construction of a power generation scheme in the Central Highlands and formed the Hydroelectric Department. It was a long way to Watamana in those days. Before this wooden tramway was built from Redgate near Bothwell, there was only one way to reach the site. Advertisements stated that Watamana was a comfortable two-day walk from Deloraine. Tents and a straw mattress will be provided. The war intervened, but work continued. Men and horses labouring in harsh weather to dig canals and build wood stave pipelines that would lead the waters of the Shannon River to Penstock Lagoon, a thousand feet above Watermana's turbines. In 1916, the Great Lake Power Scheme Tasmania's first major hydroelectric project was officially opened. The Governor-General of Australia, the Governor of Tasmania and the State Premier all took their turn with due ceremony to open valves and sluice gates. The bulk of Watermana's electricity powered the smelters of the Electrolytic Zinc Company at Risdon. A transmission line with steel towers was pushed through rugged country to carry the lines to Hobart. Increasing demand led to the replacement of the small Myena Dam with a multiple arch concrete dam, an impressive engineering feat for its day. The dam was 40 feet high with 27 arches, each with a 40 foot span. Further north, the Liawini Canal was constructed to tap the waters of the Upper Ooze into the Great Lake storage. In 1930, the government gave the newly created Hydroelectric Commission the role of generating, distributing and selling electricity throughout Tasmania. Rising in Lake St Clair, 2,417 feet above sea level, the Derwent River's catchment spreads across a wide expanse of high rainfall areas in the Central Highlands. In the 1930s, Tasmania began a period of industrial expansion. Zinc, cement, carbide and paper manufacturing demanded increasing blocks of power. And the new Hydroelectric Commission began developing the potential of the River Derwent system. A small weir and the classically designed Lake St Clair pumping station were constructed at the source of the Derwent, raising the level of Lake St Clair by three metres. Further downstream, 
Another weir was built at Butler's Gorge, and the water diverted into the valley of the Nive River by an intricately designed series of canals, flumes, siphons, and pipelines. The Ogilvy government initiated the <coughs> Taralea scheme, which was built between 34 and 38. And uh, of course, the initial scheme only involved three, uh, uh, three generating sets in Taralea, and um, they were dependent on the flow of water from uh, Lake Sinclair and the diversion into the Taralea Canal. Yes, they had, um, I think there were six or seven camps spread between Taralea and um, Butler's Gorge, and the men worked out from those camps on the sections of the canal they were working on. And uh, I had their uh, accommodation, huts, and uh, messing facilities at e each of the camps. And uh, I remember going in there one one evening, it must have been winter time, about uh, six o'clock when they were having their evening meal, about a hundred men <coughs> in this uh, uh, mess room. And uh, it looked to me like the black hole of Calcutta at about seven feet high, and all these chaps sitting there, steam coming off their clothes because they were wet. Mm. The, um, cooking facilities were at one end of the room, and uh, a pretty depressing sort of sight. In 1939, continued growth and demand resulted in the Hydroelectric Commission beginning construction of a second station at Watamana. Well, when it could be both, it could be very hot up there, and uh, believe me, it could be very cold too in the winter. But it was a rough road in, Pretty rough road into Lyweny those days. And there wasn't many machines around. Things were pretty quiet. And they had just a lot of labourers and they had a little portable crusher there uh, to get ready for lining the canal, uh, the walls of the canal. And at those days I was, uh, well, I was a truck driver, but uh, you go on the spalling yammer to break the rocks to feed your truck sort of thing. And everybody contracted, there was a few contract trucks there too, and those operators, drivers, they had to work too. And uh, I remember my hands used to bleed with the spalling yammer, but the older fellas, they were a bit more cunning than me, they could look after their hands a bit better and do it pretty easily. When it came winter, they moved us down to Hilltop down to a better climate, they said, but I couldn't see much difference in it. There's icicles, used to, the washrooms, and that was well away from you where you slept. And you go down, there'd be ice hanging out of the taps and you couldn't get any water, and all those sort of things, even down at Hilltop. But Lyweny, they disbanded the place up there for the, for the winter, closed it up. And uh, it, I don't think it was a great deal better down at Hilltop, except in Lyweny, you only had a small bar heaters in your electric heaters in your room, but down till top they had wood fires as well as heaters. And that made it a lot better down there. Well, I went to Otamana in 41 by truck with the furniture. And it was a new house. And it was very nice, two bedroom, and it had all conveniences. Well, we had electric stove and hot water the shopping days was um, Friday and Saturday morning of each week and the stores come from Bothwell and opened the shop. That's the only shop we had. And you had to get whatever you wanted then to do till the next week. But we had milk fresh every day. They had cows there and they used to milk the cows and deliver the milk. And you couldn't get to Bothwell because there was no transport. The only transport was if you were sick and you'd have to get someone then to take you. But otherwise, you just stayed there. But we were quite happy there. I loved it. I was about to have the baby, which was two o'clock in the morning, and my husband had to go down to the camp 
and get someone to take me out, which was a utility with a gas producer, they called them in the days, on the back of the ute. And he had to sit in the back and stoke the fire on the way down because the petrol rationing. But they told us afterwards that we could have had petrol if they'd have known that's what it was for. But that was a bit late, wasn't it? Today, the waters of the Great Lake flow out to the north, down the Western Tiers, through the underground power station at Powhatina. Shannon and Wadamana A ceased operating in the mid-60s. Wadamana A is now a museum, featuring the faithfully restored machinery that gave so many years of service to Tasmania. Construction work slowed during the Second World War. At the end of the war, extra power was urgently needed and work accelerated on Clark Dam at Butler's Gorge. When I went to the commission in 46, uh, a big job was to get Butler's Gorge moving. So I just started pouring concrete at that stage. And I used to go out there. Um, Joe Slatter was a resident engineer who'd been with me on the, on the Hobart Bridge previously. And uh, he, he lived there, had a house which I used to go to, and there were half a dozen other houses, but not, not many more. There were very few people accommodated in married quarters, mm -hmm. main, mainly single labour. The house was just boards on the outside, and it was lined with a sort of Cecil craft. And in the winter time, when the wind blew, it used to blow it down. The ceiling had come down onto your bed in the night. And there was just a little wood stove in a tin chimney. And that was, a piece of tin was put across the top to stop the rain from coming down. But when they did that, then all the smoke from the fire came out into the room. My strongest memory of Butler's Gorge was when we had the big snowfall which lasted for six weeks. The little fences around the houses, you could walk straight across. There was no fences, they were all buried. We had no water, everything was frozen. And my husband would have to go down to the canal of the night with buckets to get drinking water and for cooking. And we would melt the snow for washing and things like that. To overcome the shortage of labour, the Hydro undertook massive overseas recruitment. An influx of immigrant workers was a feature of hydro construction sites at this time. Escaping from the ruins of war-torn Europe, many thousands of people began new lives in Australia in Tasmanian hydro villages. Among them were more than 700 Polish soldiers they became important members of the Hydro's construction workforce. Over the years, many of them moved with the Hydro, from power scheme to power scheme. At Taralea and Butler's Gorge, substantial villages grew up, with the facilities that the workers and their families needed to live comfortably in an isolated, often harsh environment. I went to Taralea in 1951. Uh, I had never seen the place before and I think if I had, we wouldn't have lived there. <laughs> we left a, a newly constructed home in Hobart and uh, we arrived in Taralea. Our furniture went before us and when we arrived there, everything was dumped in the one room. We arrived there fairly late in the afternoon with three, three children. The oldest one was three, and uh, the someone had taken the heater out of the house while it was empty, and it was very cold, of course. And uh, I just felt like having a good cry and turning around and going back to Hobart. <laughs> the week we arrived on the the following Saturday night, there was a a party at the staff house where the staff men used to 
But in each week or each fortnight, there used to be a party to welcome the new people. And we got to know people very well through that. The houses were all exactly the same. Uh, so there was no competition about who had the best house. <laughs> the only difference in them was uh, they started off basically with a two-bedroom house, which is all we had to start with. And uh, about three days later, another bedroom arrived and was tacked onto the front. And, and this happened as people's families grew, the extra bedrooms arrived. And uh, it, it was quite fascinating, really. And there was a tennis club formed, and, and most of the people who were sport-minded played tennis. We had a very strong club, good players. And uh, Bronte Park had a tennis club, and so did Butler's Gorge at this stage, and uh, Sunday was Pennant Tennis Day, and uh, that's when we played for the Allen Knight Cup each year. <laughs> The uh, 110 kV line from Taolea through to the west coast was built because of the need to augment the power that the Mount Lyle Company was getting from their uh, Lake Margaret scheme. And uh, by the time the line had uh, got a fair way over towards Queenstown, uh, it was also decided to extend it on to Rosebury for the electrolytic uh, zinc company's requirements as well. And uh, being so rugged in that area, uh, all the materials for the line had to be carried in by hand. And uh, the felling of the bush, of course, was also done by hand. In the flatter areas around uh, the Derwin Bridge area, of course, uh, they were able to use horses to uh, haul their material in. The steelwork for the, uh, for the towers had been transported from Hobart by, by truck uh, to various points along the route and uh, once having got there it was a matter of uh, putting it on the shoulder for the work parties that they were going to work each day and taking it up to the various uh, tower sites. When the Taralea Hobart line was erected the towers were able to be assembled complete on the, on the ground and by using shear legs and a forest devil winch they are erected in position uh, using the forest devil as a motive power. From the end of 1953, Moona Workshop fabricated all the galvanised steelwork required for our transmission lines. Just across the Nive River from Taralea, another set of penstocks plummets into the valley. Their water drives the turbines of the Tungatina power station and is gathered from the catchment area to the east of Lake St. Clair around Lake Echo and the Pine Tier. The uh, scheme that they were going to undertake was, uh, had almost every type of civil engineering structure that you could imagine. That's right. It started off with a concrete gravity dam. It had some six kilometres of, of uh, canal. It had about just over four through kilometers. Pretty, through pretty difficult right. country. Yes. Over four kilometers of uh, concrete flume. Yeah. There were then four little earth dams. There was a tunnel at the there end of it. There was a tunnel at the end of it. And then this massive drop down into the Nive Gorge. That's right. With, with five penstocks, yeah. the power station at the bottom. The tongue in the tunnel is unlined, except at the bottom end where there's a bit of concrete lining. And, and then there's a short section of steel lining in the form of a cone until it finishes up in just a, a virtually a cork or a bung with five pipes coming out of it. The plug itself, that's the, the so-called cork from which the, the five pipes come out, we couldn't get sufficient reinforcing steel right. and the frame was built up of 15 pound carbon steel rails, which were left over from old tramways that used to be used pre-war. There were an amazing number of engineers, technicians, foremen, that all this training just didn't involve uh, the, the top echelons, didn't, didn't just involve management, but there, there were 
fully trained inspectors developed to make sure that con materials controls were properly ca carried out. Foremen were being, being uh, trained and developed from the ranks of all this international labor that we had recruited. And it was uh, commonplace to have, uh, you know, uh, a Polish powder monkey, uh, uh, an Italian welder, <laughs> all ultimately becoming senior foremen within your organization. Far from the wild weather and rugged landscapes of the highlands, the Trevallon power development is on the outskirts of Launceston. The Trevallon Dam captures the flow of the South Esk River, and a tunnel leads the water through the Trevallon power station, then into the Tamar. As well as adding electricity to the state's grid, the Trevallon scheme gave the people of Launceston a bonus, an attractive lake close to the city for sailing, swimming, and boating. Power development moved back to the Highlands in the late 50s with an imaginative and exciting extension of the Great Lakes scheme. By drilling a six kilometre tunnel through the northern edge of the Great Western Tiers, the waters of the Great Lake were led out of the lake to the north instead of the natural outflow at Maina in the south. The lake water drops through a high pressure penstock down the face of the tiers, then through a vertical shaft to the Poatina power station deep underground. Construction of the tunnels and cavern required huge excavations using advanced engineering techniques. I think the Poatina scheme was probably the <coughs> greatest achievement of the commission. It's a, a textbook example of uh, power development. It was economical, it was built within the estimate, and uh, it's turned out to be a you know, first-rate development. The Poetina project was not a wholly Australian venture. In Italy, a company specialising in high-pressure pipes manufactured the bulk of the penstock sections. To withstand great water pressure, the pipe sections were fabricated with a low alloy shell with forged high tensile alloy bands, hot shrunk on the outside. The prepared pipes were sprung onto a gantry straddling two rails and lowered into a prepared cradle on the mountainside. There was one amusing incident, I might say, when I took the Premier up to Paratina to show him the scheme before it was put to Parliament. And we went in a four-wheel four drive vehicle to the foot of the mountain, and uh, the track progressed a couple of hundred yards up the mountainside, which is very steep, as you know. And um, we went as far as we could, and the uh, four-wheel drive wouldn't take us any further, so we turned around and said, well, the road goes up there, you see? And he said, oh, it doesn't go up there. I said, oh, yes, it goes there. He said, you can't build a road up there. And I said, oh, yes, we'll get it up there. To excavate a tail race tunnel, which is situated below the machine room floor, the Robbins Tunnel Boring Machine, more commonly known as the Mole, was used. But I'll never forget the night we broke through. It was sometime after midnight on the night shift and uh, the TV cameras had been lined up in the power station waiting for a breakthrough for several hours. Finally we did break through and oh, they got all the hand claps and cheers and things from all over the place. There was many, many people in the power station waiting for it to break through. Uh, HEC people and TV cameras and God only knows what waiting there and it broke through right online 
And then the big moment came when each one had to go through the door of the, into the power station under the TV cameras. They were pretty new those days. And uh, we were lined up and they were cheering, cheering, and we had one bloke there, Shorty Butt. I don't know if you remember Shorty. Yeah, I remember. He was always last, old Shorty. But uh, so he was last through the door, but he got the greatest cheer and the greatest write up of everybody. Below the turbines of Taralia and Tungatina, water that will finally flow into the sea at Hobart joins the Derwent above Waiatina. The Lower Derwent scheme exploits its potential in a cascade of six power stations. Liaputa, Waiatina, Katagunya, Repulse, Clooney and Meadowbank. A new construction village was um, set up at uh, Waiatina, which is really at the base of the, the tiers before you go up onto the, uh, the Knife Hill onto the plateau. And uh, that was used uh, to build both Waiatina and, and, and Liaputa uh, schemes, and also virtually all of the schemes below Waiatina. There's a variety of, of types of work. There were different types of dam. You had a concrete dam at Liaputa, uh, which, which uh, uh, quite a big flood can come down the Nive and Taralia power station was such that the, the, you didn't want the water to rise and interrupt the, the, uh, the uh, wheels of the turbines. So we had to devise a dam which uh, enabled there to be virtually no flood rise when a flood went over the dam. So we had a, a steel gate a drum gate on the top of Liaputa Dam, which sank into a hollow. All these schemes below Taralia were, were built, started in the mid-50s, and we were still short of materials. And the Waitina scheme in particular, where we had to have a fairly uh, long pipeline going from Waitina uh, down dam, the storage, down to the power station, it, it wasn't under high pressure. and. Uh, Instead of steel, which was in very much in short supply at the time, it was low enough pressure that we could do it with uh, a, what we call a wood stave pipeline, wood stave penstock. Schemes on the lower Derwent were built to meet a rapidly rising demand for power. There were several engineering firsts in the scheme. Repulse Dam was the Commission's first double curvature arch dam. The first model was tested in Portugal, and later the Commission set up its own testing laboratory in Muna. Another feature of the Lower Derwent scheme was the use of high-strength steel pre-stressing cables. When constructed, Catagunya was the highest pre-stressed dam in the world. At Meadowbank, a novel method of slip forming was used to build the cylinder that houses the turbine and generator. In developing the Lower Derwent scheme, hydro designers had to reach a compromise between power generation and agricultural land use. The result is a balanced development. The various storages on the river provide pleasant venues for recreational activities, facilitate irrigation for farmers, and help regulate the cycle of damaging floods in winter and spring, as well as generating hydroelectricity. In the late 60s, the hydro-built Bell Bay Thermal Power Station on the east bank of the Tamar River, north of Launceston. Bell Bay's role is to supply energy demands above the capacity of the hydro system and to ensure the hydro system against prolonged periods of drought. Bell Bay, an oil-fired thermal station, was commissioned in 1971. The station is only used when river flows are low and the major storages are seriously depleted. From the rugged western highlands, two major rivers flow north towards Bass Strait. The gorges of the Mersey and the Forth were the scene for Tasmania's next power development, 
which was started in 1963 and completed 10 years later. For the first time, the designers had the benefit of full contour maps for the entire area of the scheme. The one we concentrated on initially in that area was the Merseyforth, and uh, it was a very large area. It was the first time within the Commission that we developed rivers as a basin development. It wasn't just a, making a development at one part of a river, as we had done in the case of the Derwent and so on, but it was developing a whole river basin together to best advantage from economics, uh, from an economic point of view. But the Mersey Forth was the first time we, we ever used uh, computers for study of system capacity too. The key feature was to transfer the entire flow of the Mersey River to the Forth Valley. To do this, Parangana Dam was constructed on the Mersey and a six kilometre tunnel was driven through the mountain range to Lemontine Power Station on the Forth River. Sathana Dam showed dam engineers around the world how effective high, concrete-faced Rockville dams could be. At Devil's Gate, road access to the narrow gorge was a special challenge. The dam is a thin, double-curvature concrete arch. Water free-falling from the crest spillway is an impressive sight. Devil's Gate is a delightful dam, I think, to look at. Now, we had our problems during construction. Started off all right with a nice, very good rock for the, the tunnels and the penstock. Very little support required. Uh, the, the Fisher one was a, a terrible bad size to work in, a tunnel at eight foot diameter, and you had no room for anything. <clears throat> Plus the fact that we struck bad ground several times there and had to stand the light sets uh, for most of the way, actually and it was pretty wet. The problem was getting the mole out. The ground had squeezed so badly that we had one hell of a job to get it out. It was there for, I don't know, we must have been there nearly two weeks, I think, getting it out. We had to cut sets and stand new ones, and it, uh, the old locos, that they wouldn't pull it. It was a, a terrible hard job. But, uh, we finally got it out, and uh, then the big job come and stabilising the ground again. But I think that mole was the worst job that I ever had on the HEC. That I do remember, I, I suppose, uh, which was an event more than uh, an accomplishment, was the floods that we had at the Mersey Forth. I, I, I've never seen anything quite like that. The Mersey Forth Scheme features another example of how Tasmania's power developments provide much more than electricity. The Devil's Gate Dam created Lake Barrington, site of an international standard rowing course and host to the 1990 World Championships. Southwest Tasmania is wild and remote. Mighty rivers have scoured deep gorges in their passage to the sea. Greatest of all is the Gordon, and it was here that Tasmania's biggest power scheme was to be constructed. From their base at the isolated hydro town of Strathgordon, engineers and construction workers raised a daring and brilliant dam on the Gordon, and dug deep into the earth to build the underground power station. Yes, well, surveyors were vital to the, to the completion of the investigation activities and, of course, to construction too, ultimately. But uh, they had to do a great deal of donkey work in the, in the investigation days, investigation stages. Uh, you could do a certain amount from vertical photography, but always you had to get down to finer detail where uh, the ground cover, the, the scrub cover was so great that you couldn't really tell what was going on on the ground until you went in there with the ground surveys. And the Gordon Stage 1 scheme was out in the wilderness of southwest Tasmania. Uh, the uh, climate in this was really not conducive to easy construction work. It was wet. There was something like a hundred inches of rainfall. The design of an arch dam is particularly difficult 
and, and, and time consuming to do it manually. And so we wrote a computer program to enable us to do the, what was called a trial load analysis of Gordon Dam. And it took us really a couple of years to write that, that program, but once we'd written it, it only, you could do a, a, a design analysis within a, about half an hour. Near the Gordon River Dam site, Strathgordon, the construction village to house both workers on the site and permanent residents was started in the 1960s. A contract worth more than $5 million was let to provide single and married accommodation plus all major village amenities. Dams required for Lake Pedder, we, we actually required three dams for Lake Pedder, one on the Serpentine River and uh, two at the other end, uh, uh, Edgar Dam and Scotts Peak Dam. And they, they also were uh, forerunners in some of the, the advanced technology of the dams engineering world at the time. This is another feature of the, uh, of, of the scheme that the gorge was so narrow that you really couldn't have a, a, an, a power station out in the open. The only place really to put the power station was underground. And, and indeed this was done and it had to be a cavern which could subsequently take five very large 150 megawatt turbines. The major feature of, of the Gordon scheme is the magnitude of the lake, the depth of the lake and the very narrow gorge where we had to retain, uh, build a dam in order to keep the waters of the lake back. Uh, it was uh, really uh, provided lots of difficulties of access uh, for construction people and of course uh, it was a, being narrow, it really governed the type of dam because it was fairly obvious right from the start that a thin double curvature arch dam was going to be the answer for that site. Between the power station and uh, Frodgen's Gap we used a new type of material, Austen. Austen steel is a steel that according to the uh, publicity paints itself. Uh, the steel which is virtually non-rusting uh, acquires a hard patina on the outside through alternate wetting and drying, and uh, which is a process ideally situated to the Gordon area. Living in a hydro village, uh, oh, we, we, we enjoyed it. Um, before we went to, to the Commission, we'd, we'd lived under certain, similar circumstances. Um, I, I, I uh, well, the whole family in, enjoyed the, the, the range of people. The Gordon River Power Scheme involved the flooding of the original Lake Pedder. Many people were opposed to this, and the growing strength of opinion against further power development on the Gordon resulted in the federal government stopping work on the proposed Lower Gordon Scheme. Between 1974 and 1987, the hydro harnessed the power of the Pyman, one of Western Tasmania's major rivers, and two of its tributaries, the Murchison and the McIntosh, including three power stations and five dams. The Pyman scheme also involved the construction of major new roads, opening up new areas of the Wild West to Tasmanians and visitors alike. When we arrived in Tulla in June 1975, the houses that were promised to be ready by that stage were still non-existent, they were still building the roads. So we arrived with four children under the age of 10 and lived in a caravan for the first winter. No facilities, so my husband used to take our washing down to the camps every weekend and stand in a long line of 20 men doing their washing at the washing machines and they'd be all doing their overalls and work clothes and he'd be standing there pulling ladies' undies out and kids' you know, pyjamas. Mostly the village revolved around sports. People were, were certainly more sports-minded sports than they were in any of the, anything else. We had a few smaller clubs that started up, but basically sport ran 
Tuller and Tuller Rents bought. When Murchison was built to divert the water from the Murchison River through the mountain range there into the McIntosh Valley. Yeah, that's right. And I, that was quite a long tunnel, that was two kilometres long. And we bought some brand new equipment for that. We bought this three boom Atlas Copco drilling jumbo, which you must have yes, used a fair right. amount. The Murchison Dam site was certainly spectacular. I, I remember Mount Murchison towered right above it. You'd stand at the dam site and you'd have to crane your neck almost vertically up to see the top of Mount Murchison. And after Murchison, um, I think the next dam that was built was Bastion. Oh, I can remember it quite well about the big viaduct and that. that uh, yes, that's right. We had to deviate the railway. West Coast Railway line, about three kilometres, yes. it would have gone underwater. Well, the Stringers, Stringers Creek, or is now called Reese, was a, yeah. the, the biggest job we've ever tackled, I think. The, the dam was very, very high at 122 metres, and the base of the dam actually went 22 metres below sea level. But the dam itself was a mighty feat, I remember. We bought a big fleet of Euclid Earth moving trucks, was it 13? Yes, I think, I think it was. It was mm. brand new for the occasion, mm. and they were 60 ton trucks. And we bought two or three Lee Bear shovels well, to yeah. load them with, and it was just about two years non stop around the clock, just picking up rock and carting it into the dam to build the dam. Spillway, the water just leaps clear out into Stringers Creek, and it, it is the most magnificent sight I've ever seen. Started work for the hydro in 1981 at Bastion. Uh, very few females at that stage, and they were all in the office. No females at all out on site, and I had the first job that was had always been, up until then, a male job. I spent 11 years and travelled around the various sites on the West Coast. Had a ball. Site clerks are a jack of all trades, I guess, and depending on, on who the EIC is, is what jobs we did. It was good, different. South of the Pyman, the King River drains the Eldons before cutting a gorge through the West Coast Range near Queenstown and flowing into Macquarie Harbour. Construction of the King River Power Development began in 1983 and was officially opened in 1992. The King Scheme involved extensive environmental surveys, focusing on the archaeological and environmental impact of the development. Great care was taken to revegetate work sites and to clear timber, including much valuable hue and pine from the Lake Burberry storage area. Economic and environmental factors have contrived to ensure that there will be no more large hydro schemes in Tasmania for the foreseeable future. The era of dam building is marked by design and construction achievements that have made the world sit up and take notice. It's about brave women and men who work in the harshest of elements. It's about people thrown together in communities who build a comradeship that will last long after the construction town with its transportable buildings and makeshift infrastructure has been reclaimed by the wilderness. It's about doing something that will benefit thousands of Australians for decades to come. By careful planning, many of the areas disturbed by construction work are now hidden beneath the surface of the new lake. Areas above the lake have been revegetated under the guidance of the Commission's environmental officer. Work on the John Butters power station was accelerated and it came online three months ahead of schedule. 
It was also well under budget, another magnificent achievement in a scheme now notable for them. The village of Tulla, base for the Pyman development, was home to the workforce on the power scheme that marks the end of the Hydro's 80-year period of construction. The Anthony Power Development taps a number of sources in Tasmania's highest rainfall area, in the rugged West Coast Range, north of Queenstown. Anthony's scheme commenced as a result of the Lower Gordon scheme being stopped by High Court action and we started the Anthony scheme with very little design or investigation. And one of our concerns was that we didn't do any more damage to the countryside. So we did commission a very substantial report on the environmental aspects of the Anthony. And these were taken into account in the design of the scheme and certainly in the construction of the scheme. And we we're very lucky in that we did have a Tulla village, which had been built many years previous to build the Pyman scheme. Uh, the first major activity, of course, was the road linking Queenstown and Tulla. Uh, and this road went up over the top of the Anthony Plateau and the Henty Plateau. And the first two years were spent driving this 40 kilometres of road through the mountains. Now, the Anthony scheme really consists of a lot of small schemes, small dams, picking up a very large number of small tributary creeks all of which feed into the Henty River. And these are channeled into a, a cross-country canal that sidles some 18 kilometres around uh, the mountain sides. And these are the first canals that the con Commission had built for many years. It involved a whole range of different types of dams, uh, gravity dams, um, concrete deck dams, tunnels. We had quite a major pump station, miles and miles of canals, little diversion weirs, lots of shotcrete. Uh, we used a new type of material called fibercrete. We came to grips with that. Uh, we built an underground power station. Um, we broke through into Lake Murchison, which is where the power station discharges. It was virtually an underwater outlet into the lake. I suppose one of the most significant parts of the Anthony scheme is the tunnelling. Uh, there's, there's a total of seven and a half kilometres of tunnel involved with the scheme. Starting at the Anthony Dam, uh, the tunnel dives down underneath Mount Murchison. We used rail mounted equipment which was bought and um, specially designed for use on firstly the King Tunnel, which was also seven kilometres long. And it was modified slightly for the Anthony Tunnel because the Anthony Tunnel was a very there's a smaller diameter. We had to take one of the drilling booms off the drilling jumbo. Uh, the drilling jumbo, when it was used in the King scheme, was one of the biggest in the world. The power station, which is also underground, it's a single turbine, and the scheme is finished, ready to produce power. I've enjoyed meeting and working with a vast number of different nationalities. I think we've had just about every nationality you can imagine working on these schemes. Uh, in greater or lesser numbers. Um, they've all been great people. They've all put their heart and soul into working on these schemes. And I really think the Anthony scheme, in my experience anyhow, was a culmination of, of everything. Um, it was certainly in the most scenically attractive area I could imagine. Overall, our life in Tulla was so good that we've bought our house and we're keeping it. We plan to go back to Tulla many times. The Anthony Power Development brings to an end the construction of hydro power schemes by the Hydroelectric Commission using its own day labour workforce. In eight decades, there have been many landmarks and many fine achievements. A credit to the hard work of the hydro's people over the years. The building phase may be over, but the expertise in the feasibility and design of hydro schemes will not be lost. It's already serving new clients in the Southeast Asian region. In Tasmania, construction has ended, but the hydro's work goes on. In our cities and towns, 
and in isolated highland regions of our state, men and women continue working to produce the power Tasmania needs, to serve the hydro's customers, both large and small, and to seek new markets for our state's valuable power resource. So I think that the hydro people always realise that they were building this tremendous resource for the state and it's left there as a monument to the work of the 80 years that the Commission has been in construction. Everybody felt pride in it, I think. I reckon it was the best workforce, well, certainly in Australia and probably in the world. My most lasting memory would be the community spirit amongst the people and the friendships we made. The best part of Tullow were the people and has been very well served, not only by the design and professional staff, but also by the calibre of the day labour force it's had at its disposal. The hydroelectric system is the state's greatest asset. I don't think I could say any more than that.